Welcome, and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program for this webinar discussion of Reuben Jonathan Miller's Halfway Home. I'm Awiso Yub, Director of the Fellows Program. For more than 20 years, New America has supported hundreds of fellows who've gone on to publish books, produce documentary films, as well as other deeply reported projects. It's always a pleasure to be able to host our fellows at New America for their launch events. Ruben, congratulations again on the publication of Halfway Home. We're delighted to be able to host you for this conversation today. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll pass them to the moderator. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and events list so that you can learn more about our work as well as receive invitations to future fellows program events like this and you can find that information on our website. And more importantly, copies of Halfway Home are available for purchase through our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on our events page, and you can also see a link on the little icon um, under the book as well. Before I turn the conversation over to Clint, let me introduce you to our speakers today. Ruben Jonathan Miller, a class of 2019 fellow with us at New America, is a sociologist, criminologist, and a social worker who teaches at the University of Chicago in the School of Social Service Administration, where he studies and writes about race, democracy, and the social life of the city. He was a member at the Institute for Advanced Studies located in Princeton, New Jersey. He was also a fellow at the Rockefeller Foundation, as well as a visiting scholar at the University of Texas at Austin and Dartmouth College. Clint Smith, a class of 2020 fellow with us at New America, is a staff writer at The Atlantic. He currently teaches writing and literature at the DC Central Detention Facility. His debut nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, which explores how different historical sites reckon with or fail to reckon with their historical relationship to the history of slavery will be published in June of 2021. He received his BA in English from Davidson College and his PhD in education from Harvard University. We plan a host of book launch event for Clinton June, so do be on the lookout for that invitation in a few months. Thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn the conversation over to you, Clint. Thank you so much, Wista. Um, it is a pleasure and honor. I'm gonna do this thing. Sometimes when people, like the, the virtual event space, I mean, I guess we're all used to it to some degree now. Um, I think it'd be this thing like, oh, I'm gonna listen and then I'm gonna buy the book. And like, maybe, no, like right now, before the conversation starts, you can go buy the book, click on the link, click on the button, buy one for yourself, buy one for your partner, for your kids, for your dog, buy seven copies. Um, I mean, it is, I, I spent the last week or so reading this book and, and it, is, it is not an exaggeration to say that this book should be in the contemporary canon of, of work on incarceration. I mean, it is, it is one of the most important books um, on this topic that I've read. Um, and I've read a lot of these books, um, probably too many. I also should apologize because I'm, you will probably hear my children in the background. And so when I'm not talking, I'll mute myself. Uh, but I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old um, who are, uh, you know, we're all in the same house together. And we've been in the same house together for a long time. So you might hear them bang on the door and whatnot. But, uh, but this book is amazing. It, it really, really is. Ruben and I met, right before the pandemic started me, I think maybe like a year and, a, and some change ago um, at a dear friend's house and he was telling me about the project and um, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. This is, uh, and, and obviously it had been the, it had been the result of, of more than a decade of, of work. Um, and, and, I and I think that um, I didn't fully appreciate what the book would be until I sat down with it, um, until I sat down with, with Ruben and, and, and understood his story. And I don't wanna, we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. And I want Ruben to start with a, a reading, but I do wanna begin by, by saying up front um, that it's an extraordinary book and it's, it's an extraordinary achievement um, and, and belongs up there with, with the classics in the genre. So um, Ruben, please uh, go ahead and give us a, a, a short reading and then we'll, we'll hop into discussion. Thank you so much. I, I have to say it's just a real honor to, uh, to, 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 to be in this conversation with you. Thank you uh, for making time to do this. Uh, and thank you also to uh, Wista and Angela and Sarah and uh, Anne Marie uh, and, and the wonderful 2019 New America cohort for, for just always being so supportive uh, in the New America uh, organization, especially 
um, to the folks who, who, who have organized this. So I wanna um, start with a reading from chapter four. Uh, the book is, is, is broadly about the way that mass incarceration has transformed the social life of the city and is filtered into our most intimate relationships. Hello, this is a collect call from some voice that sounded like my brother's, a prisoner at the Michigan Department of Corrections. If you feel you're being victimized or extorted by this prisoner, call customer service at, some number rattled off too quickly for me to catch. The digital woman gave more instructions. To accept this call, press zero. To refuse it, press one. To prevent calls from this facility, press six. Why was Jeremiah calling collect? I'd added money to his account, or at least that's what I thought. Shit, I hissed out loud, but not quite loud enough for my young son, Jonathan, to hear. I fumbled through papers and moved books to find my wallet under the coffee mug. In Michigan, and in many states too, people in prison make calls using prepaid accounts. Calls cost 21 cents per minute, plus a $2.95 processing fee. I spent $80 a month on my brother's calls. Why was he calling collect? Did he forget his passcode? Had I paid JPay again instead of Connect Network, which also handled, quote, inmate trust funds for your loved one to buy soap and ramen noodles? We still use JPay to send emails. They were cheaper, they were the cheapest option. For 20 cents a page and 20 cents an image, you could send a five page letter. Add a dollar for a holiday e-greeting card, an email could cost $3. Return stamps cost 25 cents. Jeremiah sent updates and asked about my family. At the end, he would make requests. He'd ask me to look up job training programs or send screenshots from his Facebook page. He'd ask for books and magazine subscriptions. He'd always need money for something. Gym shoes, a television set, an AM, FM radio, each item costing twice as much as it did in the free world. I sent Jeremiah $250 for his first Christmas inside to buy boots and a television set. We didn't know the MDOC takes half of everything over $50 in a 30 day period to cover legal debts. And Jeremiah owed thousands, like every other person convicted in this country. $600 for the checked out public defender who met with him once for 20 minutes on the day of his plea deal. $1,611 for court costs. $400 for an extradition fee. $68 for the state minimum cost to record his felony record. The cash that remains from his Christmas gift left enough to buy boots or a TV, but not both. I was breathing hard now, my chest tightening. I couldn't remember if you pressed hashtag after your debit card number or wait to enter your security code. Shit, I thought. The digital lady was making me start over again. What must it have been like for Jeremiah standing on the other end of that call? Was there silence? Did he hear me entering the digits? After spending too long in my head, the call connected. What's up, Ruber Scuba? What you doing, Jeremiah asked. We caught up quickly, like we always did. He told me a funny story about the men he lived with and asked about my wife and kids. Let me ask you this though, he said, just like he always did before making a request. I was always relieved to hear his voice, but I was always in the middle of something. That time I was writing the proposal for this book. The previous time I was in a faculty meeting. The time before that I was on a date. No matter if I was sleeping or playing with my kids or trying to clear my mind, when the call came, I had to answer. Any boxer will tell you that the punch you don't see coming is the one that puts you down. The collect call you didn't expect, the court date you didn't have the gas money to attend, the conversations with your children about why their uncle was in prison and when he was coming home, the honest answer, you're not sure, the unexpected embarrassment as you sit at your desk entering an order for 30 packages of ramen noodles, what it feels like when Michigan packages runs out of the flavor of ramen noodles he wants. It's these little things the daily disruptions that managed to put you down. A million families live this way, sending money they can't afford, making court dates they don't have time for, driving five hours only to be turned away because the facility is on lockdown or because someone's dress isn't quite long enough. It's the way the guard talks to you and how you're herded single file through dingy corridors to pay too much for microwave concessions. It's watching your loved ones demolish that food and how they're marched away when the visit ends. It's feeling alone though everyone you know has experienced this. One in two Americans have lived some version of this story because half of all US residents and a full two thirds of all black people in this country have a loved one who has done time. However, it's not just the family members who are frustrated. It's especially hard for the person in prison. 
The combination of bad cell phone reception and a busy life means your incarcerated loved one can't reach you. After four attempts, he wonders if your distance is intentional. When you finally accept the charge, your tone reeks of aggravations he couldn't have caused. He's gone weeks without mail and months without a visit. He's hearing another lecture from his younger sibling about what he should be doing with his life. He's trying to raise his children through collect calls 15 minutes at a time. He's having to stand there at that payphone while his loved one complains about problems he can't fully understand. He knows what he's put you through, but he calls you because he needs you. The prison exacerbates these needs and it escalates these tensions, changing the nature of even the most intimate relationships. But it's not just like this on the inside. The prison is like a ghost haunting formerly incarcerated people as they look for work and places to stay as they sit at the dinner with the people they love. Upon release, Formerly incarcerated people are greeted by over 45,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that dictate where they may go, with whom they may live, and how they might spend their time. These collateral consequences prevent people with criminal records from fully participating in the labor or the housing market. Landlords and employers can reject their applications without an explanation. Their civic and personal lives are also constrained. They may not hold public offices. They may not sit on juries. They may not adopt a child. They may not live in the home with a foster child. And if all politics are local, the politics of mass incarceration are hyper-local. Just pick a state. New York has over a thousand entries in its legal code, locking formerly incarcerated people out of the economy. Michigan has 659. Illinois outpaces them both, over 1,200, including 500 employment restrictions, 184 civic restrictions, 20 regulating housing, and 48 that dictate family life. There are so few places where formerly incarcerated people can turn to in their time of need. Now, this is due to changes in liability law, which began in the 1980s. Tenants sued negligent landlords when they were robbed or mugged in their buildings, and the court sided with the tenants for the first time in U.S. history finding that crime prevention was a part of every landlord's responsibility. Landlords were fined under nuisance ordinances for letting their buildings fall into disrepair, for harboring drug users and gang activity, for leasing apartments to people with criminal records, for creating, quote, criminogenic environments. In 1996, Congress passed the Housing Opportunity Extension Act, requiring public housing agencies across the country to evict tenants for any criminal activity, including crimes committed on or off such premises by quote, any member of the tenant's household, any guest, any other person under the quote, tenant's control. Almost overnight, private citizens were conscripted into the nation's crime fighting machinery. This was a relation of force. Offering help to someone with a criminal record could now cost you your livelihood. Mothers were being evicted for the crime of letting their children who had been to prison sleep on their couch. Cousins, lovers, and friends who let people with records visit their home, they were evicted too. I knew that this was the world that my brother would re-enter, where the laws that prevent him from getting a job or renting an apartment also made it risky for people to offer him help. And I knew that the support he needed in prison would pale in comparison to what he would need when he returned. My brother, like every one of the 19.6 million people who have a felony record, would have to navigate what I call an economy of favors. He would be tasked with soliciting support from people who are encouraged not to help him. In fact, people who are punished if they do. You have one minute remaining, the voice said. I jotted down Jeremiah's request. I love you, bro, my brother said. I appreciate all you do. I love you too, man, I replied before the digital woman disconnected the line. Man, that joint was like a poem <laughs> of the the book and the, the the framing of it with the the phone call. That was incredibly powerful. Do you do you um did you read the audio book or did somebody else? Somebody else. Yeah, it acted, acted and Carrie Hyde read it. Got it. Got it. Um, well, you would have done you would have done a great job. I tried, I tried. I wanted to try, but it took me nine takes to get five minutes right. <laughs> so, so I said, yo, like. Oh man. So you were going to at first and then you were like, nah, let me go. I got you. I got you. Um, well, thank you for that powerful reading. Uh, I mean, that section captures so much um, of what this, this book is about. And I want to kind of start at a, a sort of meta level and then we'll become a little more granular. And, and in the first pages, you write that of the 2.3 million people who are incarcerated, 40% are Black, 84% are poor and half have no income at all. 
And I thought that that framing was so important because sometimes we can find ourselves in a range of contexts uh, talking about this, like, is it race? Is it class? Like, um, but part of what you do so well throughout the book is, is talk about and, and embody and uh, make clear the, the interaction between those two things um, and how they've interacted in your own life and then interacted in the lives of the folks you spent time with. Could you talk about the, the specificity of why you wanted to frame things both at the um, intersection of, of poverty and, and race and like why that framing um, was, was so important for you as a sociologist and, and someone thinking about this work? I appreciate the question very much. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the tricks of American racism uh, is, is the conflation of, of race with criminality, of course, but the conflation of all social problems with racialized groups and people. So much so that when you say welfare queen, you know, you think black women. So much so when you say uh, formerly incarcerated person or prisoner or inmate or something like that, you think black people. And it's absolutely true that black folks are five times more likely to be incarcerated, twice as likely to be arrested, do more time when arrested for the same offenses, you know, 10% on average in the, in the state system, 20% on average in the federal I'm sorry, I had that reversed, 20% on average in the state. I think it's 20% state and then 10% federal, but, but one of these other, um, but they, they do, they're likely to do more crime. And this doesn't relate to, 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 to whether, um, you know, to, 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 um, to, to like differences. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we know that black folks get the worst end of the state. This, 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 this is where it is. But mass incarceration doesn't stop at the threshold of the black family. Neither do any of these social problems that, 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 that we've produced through our laws and policies that initially target black people. You know, it, um, it, and, so, and so, you know, if we think about the American prison system, you know, 40% of that prison is black. White people are underrepresented for sure. But close to 40% of that prison is white, which means there's something like a million white prisoners. Mm -hmm. These are poor people. Right. You know, this, 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 so, 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 what does it mean to have a million white men, close to a million white men behind bars? You know, we, ne we never asked the question that way. Right. If we, you know, Marie Goschalk says, if you release every black person uh, uh, from an American jail or prison today, you still have one of the world's largest prisons. What does it mean to live in a, in a, in a society in which we do this, not only to people who we see as the other, but to ourselves, whoever the hour is, you know, in, in, in this case. And so, and so um, what, what I want to do is spotlight the cruelty of it. And this isn't a, a, a story that, that's, that's like race blind or something silly like that. Absolutely not. Again, five times more likely to be arrested and incarcerated. But, but you can't do that to me and not think it affects you. You know, you, you, you can't do that to my children uh, and, and not think that your children will be, will be, will be locked up too. And, and part of what you made clear in the section that you read, um, and, and there's another section in, that you um, talk about a little more extensively, and, and the prose is so beautiful and so so compelling, but it's, it's kind of talking about, and I'm gonna read just a section of it, talking about the risk that are posed not only to the, the people who are incarcerated themselves, but to their family, right? And, and I just wanna read this part where it says, it whispers into the ear of prospective employers and landlords, urging them to reject applications. And it whispers into the ears of grandmothers and girlfriends as they make life or death decisions on behalf of their loved ones, forcing them to withhold a couch to sleep on or risk eviction to help them because the state has labeled the people they care for most, the care that they care for most criminals. And then you gotta go on to talk about the tension that exists there for you and your own brother. Um, and, and I thought that that was so, we'll talk a little bit about more, about how you frame the sort of sociological nature of the text with your own sort of, uh, memoiristic, um, recollections, but, but I think the, that part is often under, under discussed and underappreciated, um, in the way that it's that incarceration is not only impacting those millions of people, you know, the 2.3 or so million people who are in jail and prison now, the 11 million people who cycle in and out of jail every year, but to their loved ones and the, the decisions that one is put in the position of having to make, like, do I, for even for you, you were like, I care about this person, 
And I really want to ensure he is doing, that I can care for him to the best of my ability, but I also can't put my family at risk. I also can't make, have, you know, my wife and child put out of this house. Like I also, and, and these are the constant tensions that people are, are thinking about in part because of the sort of legal infrastructure that exists that very, as you articulated very specifically disincentivizes and not even disincentivizes, makes illegal um, the, the act of attempting to um, bring a loved one back into your life and care for them in the way that you know how uh, because it might result in, uh, in harmful impacts for the people who are already there. Can you talk about how you were feeling navigating that tension and, and what you see more broadly? Yeah, it was, I mean, in many ways, I mean, it was, it was, it, it's, it's a very hard circumstance to, to, to live through. Um, uh, to, 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 you know, the, the, the framework that you laid out was, 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 was perfect and perfectly captures what I'm trying to do in the book, which is to show that these changes in law and policy have made it so that to help someone with a criminal record is to put you, is to put yourself at risk and to risk your livelihood. So, you know, the, the changes in interpretation of liability law in housing made it so that the grandmother would be evicted. And so if she let the grandson sleep on the couch and we saw this over and over again, she'd get threatened with eviction, she'd be evicted herself. Okay, so, so now what does that mean when she does let the grandson sleep on the couch? Because grandma gonna be grandma. Mm. And, and, and I'm gonna be me, right? Like this is my brother. So he can't, he can't officially live with me, but he can definitely crash if nobody's looking, right? So like, mm. but, then, but then, okay, so let's say he's crashing while nobody's looking for those couple days at a time. Right. And then he gotta go because he, he can't stay forever. In fact, let me, let me hop back in the grandma situation. I'm gonna let my grandson sleep on the couch. What happens when the grandson gets in an argument with the grandma? Mm. There's, this, there's this strange tension that gets introduced mm -hmm. in that relationship that wasn't there before because the power in that, the power has shifted in such a way uh, that, is, that is unnatural to the relationship. And you know, I'm a sociologist and, and you know, I think I'm social scientist, you know, broadly defined. And so I, I think, I don't, I don't typically think much about the nature, the quote nature of things in, in that way. I think, I think social relations is kind of where the, where the, where, the, where the action is, but the social relation that was in place before was a relation of love, a relation of care, a relation of the grandmother extending herself, you know, uh, dinners and, and barbecues and, 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 and time together, if, 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 if you know, the, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. so the criminal record makes it so, if I engage in those things that I'm inclined to do, because that's what we've always done, I can be put out. Yeah. I will do this thing that I'm inclined to do because I'm inclined to do it. I want to help you. I love you. Now you didn't clean your room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. oh, me taking this risk, you're not listening to me. Right. You know, it's, 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 the, the, the kinds of tensions that this happens in, in everyday relations. In, in, in one part of the book, um, there, 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 there's a man who I call Jimmy, um, who stays in a relationship with someone he doesn't want to stay in a relationship mm -hmm. with. I think in part because he has nowhere else to go because he's locked out of the political economy. He's locked out of the civic life of the city. He's locked out of the institutions, the life-giving institutions of a free society. And so he tells me in the beginning of the chapter that he wants him a hot girl. I want me a hot girl, he says. You know, and his, his, his girl is, 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 you know, she's, she's 15 years older than him. And then he's been in prison for eight years. He wants to feel like he's free and he doesn't feel free in this relationship. Uh, and months later, you know, I, I catch back up with him and he's talking about marriage. <laughs> you know, why are you talking about marriage, Jimmy? Uh, well, Jimmy, Jimmy now has a place to stay. He has someone to, to, to depend on. And, and there's some other circumstances that, that people can read about. But uh, the, it changes, it transforms the nature of, of, of these relationships. It exacerbates uh, tensions that may have already been there. And it warps, it warps uh, relations of care in mm -hmm. ways I don't think that we well covered in, in, in the literature. Absolutely. And, and I think the tension there is, is compounded by what we know, you know, in the, in the literature, in the social science about how one's relationship with uh, loved ones and community when they come out yes. is what largely dictates whether or not you will find your, like that is the thing that sort of most profoundly impacts recidivism is whether or not you got like you have been able to stay in touch with, have relationships with, 
I have a place to go. Like, do you have that couch to crash on? Do you still have a relationship with your grandmother? Do you still have a relationship with your girlfriend? Do you still have a relationship with the, the mother or father of your child, with your parents, you know? And, and so it, and, and then I think this is such a good point because even, because we tend to think about that. We're like, all right, well, if we can keep people um, in touch with grandma, if we can pe keep people in touch with uh, these folks, then, then that's the work, right? But then even if you get to grandma's house, you're saying that that's only half the job because once you get there, the, this thing is hanging over folks in a way that is fun, that fun is fundamentally different than no matter what the, the sort of ethos of care is in that house, the nature of, of the risk and the power imbalance, as you said so well, distorts um, the, the loving, caring relationship that was already there. And I think that, that the relationship between the structural and the interpersonal in yeah. that um, is so important. And I, and I wanna think about that in the context of the, what we tried to do on the, on the front end, um, not the front front end, because then we would build a social infrastructure that would prevent people from going into prison in the first place. But once they get in prison, um, and I'm thinking about this a lot because there's, uh, you know, Joe Biden has come in and one of the first things he did on incarceration was um, not a, write, write an executive order that he wasn't gonna renew the federal contracts of these private prisons, right. which, right. which is a good thing. Right. And I think that, you know, we have a more sophisticated understanding of the carceral infrastructure in 2021 than I think we did in 2010 um, collectively as a country. But I think a lot of people still fail to understand the, the relatively small um, percentage of prisons that are private and even notions of like what constitutes as private and, and public, like not private, like a not privatized prison. And what you demonstrate so well in the book are, I think, the myriad of insidious ways that like cost, um, both emotional costs and material costs are like just compound and compound and compound, whether it's the phone call that like costs this much, whether it's the sending money to the commissary, then half of it is sent to pay off a debt from a lawyer who wasn't invested or from the, you know, from this court legal fee, this legal fee or, um, so could you talk a little bit about that and the ways that, um, you know, paying for food or paying for the phone calls or paying for socks or paying for all of these things that are meant to, I think, I, and I, that are meant, they're not even luxuries, right? Like these are not, these are, these, they are additions to what the person is experiencing, but, but they are like far from luxuries. I mean, and one of the, I mean, I could, we, we only have so much time because, and I'm rambling, but, but one of the things too, that your brother talks about is just, he's hungry. hungry. He's like, I'm hungry. And, and when I, the, I've been teaching in prisons for six or seven years now, and like that is the thing that comes up so often that, that I think people on the outside don't fully appreciate. They're like, they give, they don't give us enough food, right? So you have people who feel hungry all the time. Um, and so commissary is the way, and getting food through commissary is the way that people can um, mitigate that. Um, but only so many people have people sending them money, and then you can only do so much with that money. Um, so all that's to say, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the cost embedded within um, within the prison, even if the prison itself, you know, is not quote unquote private? You know, this is a profound question, um, and um, the the public private uh, uh, presumed dichotomy, which is artificial, mm -hmm. God is artificial. The, the line is 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 not clear. It's, it's much more porous if, if we think about, you know, um, private contracts in 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 almost every prison. Right. But also, if we think about the outsourcing and the privatizing of the rehabilitative effort itself, so who's responsible to care for people to make sure that they reintegrate fully into society after their prison? It's the family. So this is the offloading from from uh, the government in this case onto the family. Uh, that that's a kind of privatization mm. that I think we don't think enough about. Um, but the 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 heart of this thing, even in getting to this question of cost, the heart of this thing is is the second artificial break, uh, which is an artificial break between the formal and the informal. Mm. So and so and so the formal criminal justice system, what does it do? 
it houses people, um, cages people. Um, it provides them with three hots and a cot will be the slang that that uh, correction staff might throw around or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but but they're not the only ones bearing even the cost of the incarceration. The prisoner gets a bill in many states for their time on the inside. Well, who's going to pay that bill? That guy's once he gets out, uh, mm -hmm. locked out of the labor market. Who's going who's going to cover that bill? <laughs> the families are going to cover that bill. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 they don't feed them enough to satiate hunger for a grown, you know, person. Uh, who's going to cover that? Well, the brother, in this case, in this story, gets to every quarter supplement the $50, which is the only amount that they won't dig into that I'm able mm -hmm. to give to my brother, to right. supplement the $50 that, that, the, that the system won't take uh, with, with, a program that they call Michigan packages. So they know that the prisoner doesn't get enough. So every quarter they say, right. you can break this, this, th these rules and you can, you can send some additional stuff only through this private industry uh, who, that, that will allow you to buy ramen noodles. So not socks, they have to buy that through the commissary, not boots, they have to buy that through the commissary, not a radio, but they can buy a calendar and you can, additional $85. So who bears the brunt of feeding, clothing, housing? There's a relationship between the formal actor, the government, and the informal actor, the family. Mm -hmm. At every juncture of, of criminal justice engagement, uh, if, if, if this is a good way to, to think about this, that we're, we're implicated, we're drawn into it. Well, that's on the inside. Now go on the outside. Right. So on the inside, the cost is borne by family and friends. And then there's the emotional cost, the cost of the loss, the cost of, you know, what does it mean to be a boy or a girl growing up? Um, there's some real beauty I'd see in those visiting rooms. There's some real beauty I'd see over the phone. There's some real beauty I'd, I'd see and feel from the families that I follow when that little girl or that little boy would know some man somewhere, even if they're in a cage, loves me. Mm -hmm. That's powerful, that's beautiful. Through that cage, through those bars, they, they, that man, that woman, she still loves me. That that that's incredible, and I, I would see that and and wrestling with that. Those would be the things that that, that sort of that that helped me write this book. That that mm -hmm. found strength, the, the the reservoir of strength that these families would bring to bear. These black families that we say are are unstructured, disorganized, weak, mm -hmm. would bring to bear. That, that that was some beauty there. They. They wrestled with that cost, they overcame it, and they supplemented it with a kind of emotional force uh, that they brought to bear on this situation that, that, that would feel impossible mm. uh, if, 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 we, if, if we laid it out uh, you know, plainly without the context, if we didn't know so many men and women go through this. Uh, uh, but when they get out, they're locked out of the, they can't get a job. They certainly can't get a living wage job. They have to pass a good character clause. You know, I, I'm thinking about Reginald Dwayne Betts' uh, uh, experiences that were chronicled in, in you know, the New York Times mm -hmm. and the, uh, sources. Uh, he's gone on to get a law degree. You know, um, you know the famous headline. You know, let this ex-convict have you know uh, pass the bar or something like that. Mm -hmm. there, there's a panel. There's a conversation. You know, are are you are you are are, are you exceptional enough for mm -hmm. us? allow you to have the thing your test score says you should have mm. you know for a, a, a rental application the kinds of uh costs that get born in that family system they have to figure out not only how to pool together the money to to, to help this person stabilize and get an application but they have to pool together a set of references and resources that that will convince the landlord to rent an apartment to somebody who's got a credit score that would qualify them and who maybe has finally gotten the job, mm. figuring out how many couches to sleep on to, to find sustainable employment, has finally gotten the job. Now they need a set of references. They got to do a dance. They got to go cap in hand and prove to the landlord, I was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, now I see. Please rent me an apartment. These are these are the costs that are borne by this entire network, not just the individual, you know, but but the entire the entire network, the entire community. But it but it's not just born. And the reason why um, the, your initial question was very important is is because a transformed family life uh, for for half of the country, because 
half of the country uh, has had a loved one who's gone to an American jail or prison mm -hmm. means a transformed country. <laughs> means the country operates in a way that it wouldn't normally operate. Right. What would life be like if we didn't have this hanging over our social relationships? Right. And I, I, think, I think we could make something much more beautiful uh, 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 if we tried. Yeah, I just have, I have, uh, I want to leave time for the audience to ask Q&A. Um, so if folks have have questions, please put them um, in the Q&A box um, and we'll try to get to them. My last thing, you know, you wrote, honestly, one of the, the sometimes you read a book and then you're like, dang, I should have done this like that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting, my book comes out in June. We have, and, and for those who don't know, Ruben and I have the same editor. Um, who's this, you know, Vanessa uh, Mobley is brilliant, fantastic. Uh, we're very lucky. Um, but I read Ruben's uh, sort of method section. If you're about this, uh, this, about this project, basically. I was like, damn, this is much more beautiful than mine. Um, I was like, Baldwin's here. We got like proximity. I was like, oh no, I got, is it too late? I'm about to email Vanessa. <laughs> Can we switch it? Is it at the printer yet? Um, but it honestly is a beautiful, beautiful method section. And what did you say? You're thinking about proximity, right? Because because obviously the nature of what makes this story different um, than uh, a quote unquote traditional sociological text is your own proximity to the story, right? Uh, both as a someone who grew up in a poor black segregated neighborhood um, and as somebody whose father was in prison and whose brother was in prison and who grew up uh, surrounded by the multiple apparatuses of the carceral state, and and you think very take very seriously proximity as a as a method, right? And you say a sociology of being together takes proximity as a method and an analysis because to the careful social scientist, proximity is a gift. Um, could you talk just briefly before we hop into Q and A about how your own proximity to this story um, shaped the way that you that you wrote it? Yeah, I think there are real strengths in, in um, social scientists and journalists and storytellers generally trying to be objective and taking critical distance. Mm. And I think there's a strength there. I think it tells us some things. Um, but there are things that it can't tell us because the, the, the writer uh, doesn't allow themselves close enough to see how things get revealed uh, 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 on the ground as it were. So, so I can spend six years uh, doing field work and, 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 and being close to people, eating dinners, spending time with them, being together. Um, but then I go to write. And when I go to write, I distance myself from my subject emotionally because I'm taught to. Mm -hmm. And I distance myself from, from the, the, the things that I learned even being together during that time because I'm trying to make some claim about what it is that I see. And it's very important to do that so people take you seriously. But when I do that, when I distance myself from my emotional connection, my political participation, my, 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 my social position together with these folks, mm -hmm. I miss what it's like to be together. Mm -hmm. So I'll start paying attention to bright and shiny objects. Like, and I'm, I think people need to study the prisons, but we've studied the 2.3 million people who are located in a prison and we haven't spent any time at all with the 80 million people who have a criminal record in this country and, and what that means. Mm. And, so, and so I'll miss what it means to live with a record because I'll be paying attention to what it means to have at one point been in prison. I might even study housing and I might say how many people have been unable to get housing and, and let me chronicle your inability to get your housing. But I might miss what it's like to be in relationship with someone who can't find an apartment or how they relate with their grandmother or how they relate with me even because I've written myself out of the story. Hmm. So what I try to do is, 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 is I try to allow myself closeness to both what I feel, what I'm, experiencing mm -hmm. uh, and the experiences and the feelings of the people that I'm following. I try to allow myself closeness to my own pains, though they're different, 
So my pains are going to be different from my brother's pains. They're not the same. This isn't this is about empathy say, but I, I try to allow myself closeness to my own pain so that I can understand something about my brother's pain and the pains of the people who I follow. Being close allows me to see things that distance doesn't let me see. And so, and so I take, I take this closeness as, a, as, 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 as a method and I try to write up what that is um, in the appendix of the book, which I, I really appreciate you bringing it up. It's called the gift of proximity. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that it's, it's useful. And I tried to write that not as a methods appendix because I didn't want people to, you know, fall asleep, you know, <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, I think about my own, um, uh, Roberto Gonzalez, uh, taught me, uh, I'm taught my methods course in graduate school. Um, and we read all of these different methods um, sections, which is like, uh, you know, such a sociologic, sociology, you know, grad student thing to do. But, but I think what you've done is so, it's so beautiful because you wrote it in ways that I think are, will be, will make it part of the curriculum of all of these methods, qualitative methods classes throughout sociology schools um, throughout the country, I hope. Uh, but also just for someone who is interested in how you were thinking about the construction of this project um, just provides so much rich insight. So I, I'm very grateful to you for that. So we're going to hop in, answer as many questions as we can. Um, <clears throat> question from Hannah. Can you speak to the impact incarceration has on an incarcerated person's family and loved one's ability to participate in the communities they exist in? I know of some research from Ariel White on the disenfranchising impact of incarceration on family, on families of those in jail and prison. But I wonder about uh, about what that distance. I, but I wonder about that might distance friend, family members from how that might distance family members from their community. So you spoke about that briefly, but maybe about um, the family members' ability to participate in the communities as they exist, which which is fascinating because as I think about like how does if you are the person letting somebody sleep on your couch right you have to move through the community differently right like you got to make different decisions about how like you know who you let into the house right. who you let who you tell who do you trust to tell your that that person is there do you let when do you let them out of the house what does it mean if people see that person coming and going knowing what is it so that is fascinating that's a great question hannah i'm curious what you think yeah no i think i think i think i think that precisely that that um, your freedom to, your freedom of movement is is, is, is is restricted you know it's interesting one of the uh, people who I followed um, would tell me you know when 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 you go to prison it's not just you in prison they're they're there with you you know is is, 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 is what he said and um, so is that there's also the weight of not being able to care for your loved one in the way that you want to. There's a lot of interesting work on the effects, the mental health effects of it, of, 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 of say over policing and, and, and incarceration on, for example, mothers, so that their children are incarcerated and they, they, they're these mental health effects that get worn that I don't think get enough attention uh, in the public discourse. Uh, and then finally, there's questions of civic participation. Well, how, how civically active can you be? How active in your community can you be if you're sending all your disposable income and lots and spending lots and lots of your time trying to care for someone who's locked in a cage? So, so, so there's the fiscal impact of that in the family system. There's the there's the emotional impact. There's the psychological impact, and then there's the logistical, the time, the impact on the time uh, that that this woman has, who's probably. Uh, uh, keeping a job, probably raising some children. Mm -hmm. You know, this 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 cousin, this man, this brother, this 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 uncle has doing the same kinds of things. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question, Hannah. Uh, here's a question from New America's own Amory Slaughter. Uh, I'm very struck by Ruben's point that although African Americans are vastly overrepresented in prison populations relative to their percentage of the U.S. population, there are still one million white Americans in prison a huge number. Is there a white prison reform movement? Is there a way of making a common cause in a way that uh, helps to counter the stereotypes of blackness equaling criminality and increase the political power of the movement overall? Uh, so I'm not aware of a white prisoner uh, movement per se, but I am aware of prisoners um, banding together as a class 
of people and pushing against the laws and policies that hem them in. And so one example of this uh, is an organization that, that's in New York, Just Leadership USA. It's a national coalition of formerly incarcerated activists who, who work together to do a few things. So all of them were already activists. Um, and so what Just Leadership USA tries to do is to build the capacity of these activists to do their work in a more impactful way. This is very, they have run, uh, the, the leadership is, 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 is formerly, incarcerated, uh, formerly incarcerated people, the board members, many of them, not all of them, because you need people with, you know, I mean, not that no one who's formerly incarcerated has deep pockets, but, you know, you need deep pockets, you need people from foundations, you need people from rich families, you know, you need all these sort of things. But board members are also formerly incarcerated people who've, who've, who've made a name for themselves. This isn't to say that the model is perfect, but this is to say that this is a group of people who are, who are, who are banding together around the idea of having a criminal record. I'm thinking about all of us and none in California. I'm thinking about um, the, the kinds of organizations that, the, you know, the, the OG, Susan Burton uh, in, in, in California participates in, the formerly incarcerated people and families network that gets together every year. So they, they're these coalitions of formerly incarcerated people who come together um, and, 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 and form, uh, 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 form around the just cause of uh, addressing the impacts of incarceration on, on, on people like them. But they also address other things. It's, it's, it's really striking to follow these activists out. In fact, part of my work follows activists uh, across the country um, to understand what's happening. But they're not just involved in, in questions of criminal justice reform. They're really involved uh, in, 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 in the work of trying to make the world a, a much better place. So that they're, they're doing uh, services, they're doing uh, anti-poverty work, they're invested and participate in things like the Moral Monday events, you know, they, these kinds of things. Uh, they, they're doing anti-violence work, um, they, they're deeply involved. The, the last place that you see uh, this group being called for um, uh, uh, but nothing being done in response, meaning uh, we don't reward them beyond the paycheck for their work doing good, is the whole movement of credible messengers and violence prevention, mm -hmm. where, where, where the cachet is for you to have, say, been convicted of a gun crime or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and what they expect you to do is put your body on the line, go and interrupt the fight, or, or, or just talk to these kids who are, who are picking up guns to help them put the guns down. And this is powerful and beautiful and important work. And, and, and there are different kinds of studies about their effectiveness and this sort of thing. And that's not really um, uh, the, the, the point for me. The main point for me is that once these men and women across the country who've been involved in violence put their gun down and then try to reclaim the streets, try to change the streets so that kids don't go through the things they go through, what do they get at the end of it beyond the check? They still can't vote, they still can't rent an apartment, they still don't have a place to stay. And this is something that we have to fix. We have to fix our commitment <clears throat> to them. Definitely. Um, several people have asked uh, specifically about um, what it was like to write this book, having an incarcerated family member um, and people who themselves have had uh, incarcerated family members are thinking about um, how you toe the line of advocating for your brother without making assumptions about his experience or, or centering yourself and your own perspectives in that. So, so that's one part. And then the other part comes from uh, our fellow New America fellow, Sarah Jackson, um, a brilliant academic herself, uh, who says as a fellow black academic with the experience of having an incarcerated family member, I'm interested in your decision to reveal uh, at all this part of your family, of yourself and of your family. What kind of professional pressures and questions did you grapple with in the decision to reveal your personal experiences alongside the families you follow? Thank you for these questions. Um, I'll say writing the book wasn't always easy, but the experience helped me quite a bit. What I tried to do, I tried my best to get in touch with how I felt and how I experienced the thing and use that drive the kinds of questions that I would then ask of the people who I was following. So I try my best to remember my pain and, and, and the source of that pain. Okay, you know, what does it mean to send these ramen noodles? So, so, so now when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking to somebody, I can talk to them about the visit, specific things about the visit. I can use that to, to, to and this is gonna sound crass, but to my advantage, as far as understanding the situation and helping other people to walk me through it, the second thing that I did to make sure that I wasn't, um, while I'm present in the study, and I'm present in the study because I should be in the study because I was born poor and black after 1972. And if, if, if statistics are right, unless everybody's wrong, 
then, then, then I'll be impacted by it. I would have been in my own study had I not known myself. <laughs> if this makes any sense. Uh, and so, and so, and so, and so, um, what I tried to do is, is, is check back in with the people who I was following. You know, in social science, we call this member checking. You know, I would talk to them, and sometimes I get things wrong. Mm-hmm. And people would tell me, you know, there's a there's a point in the in the book um, where I'm where I'm trying to understand a history of trauma. That, that, uh, that, that, that one of the brothers who I follow is experiencing. And I presume that it came from, uh, you know, one member of the family, his father, and, 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 it, and, and he corrected me. No, that wasn't the case. What happened was this. And he, and he walked me through. And that's how, I, that's how I wrote the chapter or that section of the chapter, his corrections. Mm-hmm. His corrections. And in fact, his corrections told me something important. They told me, uh, because I, this is someone who, who, who I, I'd known for many years and who I'd grown close to. And it was like, okay, I'm making presumptions. That's part one. And, and I need to check those presumptions. Part two, there are things I would have never asked if this was a kind of hit and quit sort of study. Because it was over the long term, because I had access to people, because I could ask them about the experience and because I could present my experiences to them and reflect back their experiences as I experienced them. Uh, it, it, it provided uh, an, an opportunity for me to get things right that I may have ordinarily got wrong. The, the decision to to reveal um, my own experiences in this book uh, and the, the institutional pressures that came with it, I tried to do a couple of things. I tried to write, um, uh, I revealed this stuff because if I was being honest, uh, when I wrote, I would have been in the model, this point that I raised earlier. Um, and I think there's an act of dishonesty that not that people, not, not, not sharing is not dishonest, but I'm saying like, there's this, this distance that, that, that we're taught to pre- assume that hides things that, that, we, that would ordinarily, that would be revealed to us if we, if we allowed ourselves to be close to it. And so, and so I decided I'm gonna take this risk the risk is worth it. As far as the kinds of professional risks, I'm, 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 I'm glad to have benefited from supportive uh, uh, colleagues um, who, who, while they maybe at first didn't understand what I was doing, um, when they started seeing uh, close to finished works and realized that I wasn't losing any of the theoretical heft, that, um, that the, 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 the rigor uh, that I brought to the studies, the, the book consists of basically three studies, which makes it sound boring. I kind of was not trying to say that, but <laughs> to, to the studies that, that, that comprise the book, mm-hmm. the thing I brought to the studies that comprise the book, I was putting on myself. Uh, and so, and so they, 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 they saw that, they, thankfully they're seeing this as a kind of innovation uh, and I'm grateful for that. We have uh, just a few minutes left because we want to honor everybody's time, but this is your reminder to go to bookshop.org slash sock shop slash solid state and order your copy right now. I already have a copy. I'm going to order another copy. Um, we just like really support this book, um, support Ruben um, or Dr. Miller, if you want his students. I don't know what they call you. Dr. We're going to go with Dr. Ruben, Dr. Ruben, Dr. Ruben Miller. Um, but uh, we'll try to get two more in. Um, a question from the audience, something I found very powerful hearing you talk about your work is how the gross expansion and overreach of the punishment apparatus takes a toll on our collective moral consciousness. You said earlier, quote, you can't do that to me and not think that it affects you. As someone who's been doing this work for decades, how have you seen that collective ethical failure affect us politically, socially, and in how we talk about and think about what punishment and accountability are? You know, it's, it, thank you for that question. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a powerful one. Um, this was Dr. King's uh, observation in, 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 the, in, in, in the, the famous, uh, you know, Selma speech where he talks about feeding the, 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 you know, poor white people, Jim Crow, you know, he calls it the last racism as the last outpost of psychological oblivion. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this is Du Bois's observation about by, 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 by talking about slaves as workers in black reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, 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 is a, this, 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 this observation um, comes from a long history of, 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 of scholars who are concerned with these kinds of questions and mm-hmm. 
And the, the, the place that we see it, we can see failure in the criminal justice system itself, our refusal to address violence in any meaningful way. Uh, and and, and in, in refusing to address violence in any meaningful way, our communities get no less violent. So while we've seen a quote, great crime decline, which is absolutely the case, crime rates, violence, rates of violence have dropped precipitously in the last 40 or 50 years, it's absolutely the case. We see a concentration of violence uh, in, in some neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods look a certain way, low home ownership, residential segregation, uh, uh, poor, et cetera. And it looks the same in poor black neighborhoods as it does in poor white neighborhoods. We learned this from uh, Lori Crevo and Ruth Peterson's excellent studies starting in somewhere around 1999 that told us when you control for residential segregation, for home ownership, for poverty, for education, that white homicide rates equal black homicide rates. This, this, is, this is so striking that we've done almost nothing in, 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 in poor rural communities around these questions because we presumed blackness and criminality are the same thing. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, what we've done is we failed to care for poor whites, you know, et cetera. So th this is just one example. I could, I could, I could give you more, but uh, I, should, I, should, I should be mindful of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, gonna do, uh, we're gonna do this thing where we ask, I'm gonna ask three questions together. I'm gonna ask you to answer them. I think this will be our last, our last go around. Um, so one, you should also know that everybody's very hyped for you. They're <laughs> like, that's my man. Shout out to Ruben. He's out here killing the game. Your community is here and, and just so, so proud. Uh, if you haven't read, he just had an excellent review in the New York Times, uh, which like people need to know, like getting a review in the Times at all is hard to get, much less getting one where they're like this powerful, important book. I mean, it's game changer, game changer. Um, so you gotta answer these questions because they're talking to me in red on the dock. Um, they were in bold and red. They're like, wrap it up, Clint. Um, so has your brother read the book? Um, and also, uh, and how has your brother read the book and what does he think? Um, and what are, what's the last question? Um, and as you begin talking about the book more broadly um, with the general public, um, what do you find? Do you find that they're unaware of a lot of these issues or do you think that your, was your goal to make people aware of something they weren't aware of before or to just frame uh, the literature in a different sort of way? I think, I think uh, so the last question, both, I think people are unaware of the extent, the reach of, 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 the, of our carceral system. I, I don't think people are, are aware of how it affects um, the American family, how it filters into the American democratic project. I think when we think about uh, democracy and civic engagement, we think about voting, and that is but one part, perhaps the perhaps not even the most important uh, aspect of civic engagement. I mean, certainly a very important aspect. I don't want to say don't like, voting is very important, but it's it's just one part. Uh, another kind of bright shiny object thing, but but there are many ways that people are, are civically engaged or not. Um, uh, and, and and this group, I don't I don't think we're aware of the degree to which that happens. At the same time, we also needed to reframe how we thought about things to kind of get our mind uh, to, to want, honor and address what it means to be in prisons, jail, solitary confinement, drug, the war on drugs, all stuff is very important, um, but to, to make space for a more expansive discussion of, 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 of what punishment does by paying attention to it inside and also outside of the system of punishment. Um, so that's, that's part one. My brother has uh, read parts of the book, uh, you know, and and uh, and and he's and he's talked to me. He tells me he's very proud of me, and so I don't know if that means he likes it or if he, <laughs> he's very proud. But he says, "Ruben Scuba, if anybody can get something out of this shit, I'm glad for him." Like, like, like that's what he that's, that's, that's what he that's what he says. To me. Word, word. Well, thank you so much, Ruben. Um, this has been uh, I, we could talk for for hours, and hopefully. Um, we'll be sitting around a dinner table again together in the after times. Um, but we're going to send it back to Awista to finish us up. Again, buy the book. Go buy it now. Don't say I'm going to do it later. Don't put it in your tabs. We all got too many tabs open. Do it now. Um, support Ruben in this incredible, incredible, incredible book. I can't wait to see um, how it impacts the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.